SciShow Tangents is brought to you by Henson Shaving, which is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that's bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. Visit hensonshaving.com slash tangents to pick the razor for you and use the code tangents and you'll get two years worth of blades free. Hello and welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green. And joining this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. I'm back, baby. He's back, baby. <laughs> All right, you two. What's your teen name? What does that mean? <laughs> Sari, just tell me and the people will figure it out. Don't explain this to them. Oh, okay, no. don't explain it. Don't. <laughs> don't explain the, it. Everyone's favorite thing, an inside joke that no one knows. Yeah. Uh-huh. My... My teen name is Mountain Dew Grape Fanta. Mountain Dew Grape Fanta is a surprise to me uh, because of how Grape Fanta is so gross. <laughs> <laughs> it's so delicious is the thing about it. And all cool teens know that Grape Fanta uh-huh. is the hidden gem of sodas. Oh, yeah. And all cool teens know that Mountain Dew is bad. I don't know, actually. Maybe these days they don't like Mountain Dew. Maybe Mountain Dew is a Gen X treat. Well, I guess the other thing is I'm very, I was a very uncool teen. So maybe that's it's even true. more appropriate for my teen name mm-hmm. to be so counterculture um, yeah. and just oblivious to it because I'm in my yeah. own little bubble. Samuel Schultz. Okay, my teen name is Squirt Lime Coke. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little raunchy, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my name is... say that on the on Hello, science I'm Squirt. Podcast. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those nicknames for children that sounds quite innocent, but actually isn't. Well, when it was invented, it, yes. <laughs> when it was invented, it was fine. <laughs> Since then, the internet's existed, and you know. I used to be Dr. Pepper Pomplamus LaCroix, of course. I think I've come around on Dr. Pepper, and I might be more just like straight diet Pepsi Pomplamus LaCroix. Diet is almost cheating. Because diet, anything is disgusting, but... I don't think you're right, Sam. I think a lot of people really love Diet Pepsi. And especially uh, Diet yeah, Coke. Yeah, that's like, true. I know people who drink so much Diet Coke. That's true. I think mo- maybe more people like Diet Pepsi than real Pepsi. Who likes real Pepsi? Show of hands. Sorry know. to Pepsi. The only time Do I you really? A... Yeah, yeah, they're you're real... The... Pepsi I think Pepsi tastes audience? better than Coke. If <gasps> so, if you're at a restaurant and somebody says Coke is, we don't have Coke. Pepsi's okay. You go absolutely. I love Pepsi. Even and better. And then they yeah kick you out of the like, restaurant. I'm thrilled. This is a social experiment. You're not supposed to say yes. Sari, you have you have said so many things that have shocked me. Uh, just about your sort <laughs> of like your the way that you perceive the universe differently from me. My perception but of beverages. I, pre- I prefer Pepsi is really <laughs> throwing me for a loop. <laughs> Every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts and also teen names, which we still didn't explain to you. And I guess we're just not going to. I don't even know if you can watch the thing that explains what it I is. I don't anymore. know if you can. There's <laughs> probably <laughs> clips. I bet there's yeah. clips. Just search teen just Google names. It. Yeah. Our panelists are playing for glory but also for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of you people will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Sari. A central quest of being human is to somehow delay death. And today (laughs) that has turned into an avoidance of bad breath. Is there something more innate that's going on behind the scenes? Or does culture dominate all of our rise and shine routines? It seems that the root of hygiene is fighting off disease by wiping up or washing hands off after you have sneezed. There is something biological, behavioral in genes. Ants and cats and birds and apes all take the time to preen. But then there are subjective things like shaving off your hair. Is it for bugs or social pressures that shape what we bear? Mammals cleanse their fur of dirt or grime that leaves a sheen. But how much soap or elbow grease even counts as clean? So when it comes to hair or skin or teeth and caring for you best, a part of it is science, but then we make up the rest. Mm, We just make up the rest. It's the topic of the day is hygiene, which what you're saying is I probably do more than I need to. 
is what I'm hearing. And I'm going to take that to heart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like you can look around at all at all the the rest of the animal kingdom and be like, we're doing something wrong because they are they aren't doing they any of the stuff we're doing and they don't stink too bad. I smell my cat every day. She smells great. Yeah, but cats do wash a lot. But we, but just in their own way, I wouldn't want to do it the way the cats do uh, no. by just by licking myself. Mm-mm. But also, just so you know, animals experience a, a great deal of negative consequences from ha- not having hygiene. Uh, and okay, okay. I, I often hear this is like, why don't dogs have to brush their teeth? And it's like, well, eventually they, they get dental disease and it's very bad and they die often oh, of it. Okay, uh, especially in the wild. Well, you can see. You can like open up your little dog or cat mouth and you can see them. They're yeah. kind of gooey and gunky. They got stink mouths for sure. Definitely and you do got to brush their teeth yeah. at some point if you like want them to maintain like their teeth. I not have out. never brushed my cat's teeth. And... I guess I haven't brushed a cat tooth. I've I've used to brush my dog's teeth. Yes. Up. I would I'm scared to go in there with the cat teeth. <laughs> Pointy They're and small. Needles. Yeah, I was recently told that it was kind of cool for my cat. Like the cat's biting is just like part of, you know, fun and play. And so I should just let her, let him do it. Oh. I'm like, no. Who told you that? <laughs> Did a cat tell you that? I don't remember. Did your cat tell you <laughs> <Yeah>. that? <laughs> <laughs> it was just cats on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah pretending to be people. <laughs> Probably what it was. It's fun. Just play <laughs> mm-hmm. with your cat. Has anybody ever actually seen the McElroy brothers? Because <laughs> I think they're just three cats. <laughs> Hygiene, though. Sarah, hygiene. what's hygiene? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I couldn't think of a segue, so that works great. Um, yeah, I think there is a lot of misconceptions around hygiene, but there are also a lot of unknowns about hygiene, which makes room for those misconceptions. Colloquially, it's any sort of like cleanliness around yourself or your surroundings. And so that can mean like microbiologically fending off germs or disease in various ways, washing hands. Uh, or cleansing yourself of dirt or grime that could become breeding grounds for bacteria or other other things. Medically or societally, it can mean sterilization of equipment or like water or sanitation systems, waste disposal systems. But then I think a lot of times when people talk about hygiene, they're talking about like morning routine stuff. So um, do you bathe or do you like wipe your butt when you poop or uh, are you modifying your keratin in some way are you like cutting your hair or trimming your nails um, are you brushing or flossing your teeth and then and, and like those in general have a relation to medicine um, in general mm. taking care of mm. yourself in those ways can reduce the chance of abrasions or um, infections or or whatnot but then Also layered on top of that are like societal or cultural pressures for hygiene and what is hygienic in one society can vary or not. Like some cultures encourage beard growth and maintenance Mm. in some ways. Some cultures are like clean shaven is more hygienic. Um, Different smells are considered more or less hygienic. Uh, Deodorant is a fairly recent invention and Mm. push to society. Um, and covering uh-huh. it up with perfume or or other like artificial or concocted scents as opposed to like having natural body odor. And oh, I, and I guess to like the argument that hygiene, like we didn't have to do it. Like we've been doing hygiene for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to look back at human history. And what's tricky is that like you can't necessarily fossilize hygiene. Like you can't tell how someone smelled based on their sure. bones. Uh, <laughs> like those aren't those aren't stinky Hank bones. Those are fresh Hank bones. <laughs> uh, but we have evidence through artifacts, so like combs or stones mm-hmm. that we think were used as like abrasives to remove hair, or like old versions of razors, or like art and texts of people describing things. Al Jazari, who is my favorite uh, Mesopotamian like roboticist, he made all kinds of <laughs> this whole book of <laughs> mechanical devices with these elaborate illustrations. Is he the only from... Mesopotamian roboticist? <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> okay. Probably not, but he's the famous a... guy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch now. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but in in older times, uh, in like the, <laughs> you know. Just people living in that part of the world. Yeah. People, people living, working with the robots. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
he did it he did it like a couple thousand years ago um and he designed like an automaton for ritual hand washing like mm. a peacock oh. and a spout or things like that so interesting in the bible they're they're always yeah. anointing people with oils putting and they're washing each other's feet the hand washing thing is like robot is interesting to me i guess because I know about like the doctors who were like, Hey, you don't got to wash your hands. Don't worry about it. Is that just like something that we had gone back and forth on or were they washing their hands? Cause they were sticky. Then germs were another thing that we didn't think about yet. I guess your hands have always been yeah, sticky. You're eating honey point. all the time. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Mesopotamian <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, little figs. Uh-huh. I think we went back and forth on it. I think a lot of earlier hand washing from what I have gathered was more intuition based. So like something disgusting happened and I must cleanse right. myself. My hands stink. Or, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. stinky. I got to fix that. Or there was a lot of association with um, like you can't use unwashed hands to pray at an altar in various religions uh-huh. or uh-huh. A, a lot of like religious significance or spiritual significance. There was a lot of like, you must wash before you interact with a sacred object. And that was probably because when people didn't wash their hands, they got sick. Yeah. And so then there was some correlation between unwashed hands and and the devil. Yeah. Um, Mm, Sure. But then I think to cross over from religious intuition or personal intuition into scientific practice, there was a level of doubt of like, well, why? That, why are you why are you making this do this? That makes sense. So and I assume that the word hygiene comes from just the guy named Gene and we just like say hi to him at why he's also, the guy who washed your feet. Hi Gene. While we do our teeth. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. He's yeah. The, he's he, the he did guy. your feet. He did your hands. Um it was from in, a guy. Kind feet of. And hands. <laughs> <laughs> from the Greek word hygiene, uh, which is the healthful art from oh. hygis, oh. uh, which is healthy or sound or hearty or living well. Um, who is pers- and all these like concepts were personified as the goddess Hygieia. So oh. there was, there was a guy, there was a lady, there was a lady, wow. a lady guy. Um, so I could go like, back in time to ancient Greece and say hygiene, and sit, people would be like, "You're from here. Welcome, welcome home." Uh huh. Yeah. They're like, "She's that way. Wash your hands <laughs> yeah. before before going." Yeah. <laughs> and they just be following you around, being like, "You want us to wash your feet?" I don't know why we do that, oh. but we do that a lot. <laughs> Not again. Yeah. Thanks, though. They're pruned up. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's make more podcasts by playing this week's game. Are you ready to do it? Yeah. Yes. Humans are always finding new and interesting ways to approach our grooming, and going through history shows us all sorts of examples of our hygienic ingenuity. So today we're going to be going back in time to revisit some of those developments with a game of the scientific definition. I'm going to name some kind of item to you, and you're going to have to both describe to me what you think that item is, and whoever comes closest to the actual answer, as judged by me, wins. Word number one. Phrase number one, thing number one, is the mustache spoon. Oh. I feel like I'm at a disadvantage having never had a mustache. I don't know I if Sam can't. has ever had a mustache. Sam's never had a mustache? <laughs> oh. Well, okay, Hank, <laughs> you don't know me. You never know me my whole life. <laughs> but that is true, sadly. I tried to grow a mustache at the beginning of the pandemic, much like many people did. Didn't work mm-hmm. out. That was a safe time to try to grow a mustache. Because you don't, nobody was seeing you. you. had a mask on all the time. Nobody was seeing you. It's great. But I cannot. Confirmed. Cannot. I tried for months. Didn't work. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so my facial hair is, is finally growing back after chemo. And the, I swear that I have way more facial hair than I did before. Oh. Treatment. Interesting. And I'm like, should I try and grow it out and see if I have yes. facial hair now? I think you should grow a mustache for sure. The mustache spoon. <laughs> Maybe it's not even have to do anything with the mustache, but it probably does. I bet it gets boogers out of your mustache. Because I bet you get, I don't know, maybe you get boogers in a mustache. I would be worried about that. Okay, a mustache spoon. I think it is, I like, (laughs) this is a real stretch of my empathy. I can't imagine what it's like to have a mustache. I'm going to (laughs) say it is something you use to like apply... So instead of removing something, you applying something like like how you apply beard oil, you apply oh, mustache oil something. with a mustache yes. spoon. And it's I just like, like a little tiny guy that you're like. All right. I think that though you're both wrong, Sari is closer because oh. the, what the, the thing is being 
is going in, not coming off. <laughs> okay. The mustache spoon was designed to help men with large mustaches eat food without oh, getting dirty. So obvious. <laughs> it's so literal. Yeah. So literal. It was very common in the Victorian area in many countries for men to have big, elaborate mustaches. But that, of course, yeah. comes at the cost. Uh, eating was particularly perilous. Ugh. If they were consuming something hot, the wax holding their mustache shape in place might melt. Oh, worst no. Of all, they could end up with food in all of their facial hair. Oh. So they had the mustache spoon, which was a spoon with an added piece of metal called a mustache guard. And the guard was set <laughs> above the bowl of the spoon so that as the user bought, brought the spoon to their mouth, the guard would prevent anything from touching the mustache. Uh, and in addition to mustache spoons, there were mustache cups that featured various guards to protect the user's mustache from hot tea or other beverages. You could also not slurped. You could have just gone like, like here comes the airplane. Ah, oh, oh, and then that's oh, it. Oh, oh, no, true. no sipping, nothing tilting yeah, into your mustache at all. Tea these too. Were, just these oh. were fancy yeah. times. Yeah, that you're just drink about, your though. tea like the the guy from the Man Show with two beers. Yeah. Like, oh, oh. Oh. The guy from the man show. <laughs> he probably had a mustache. Y'all remember that? God, I'm know. old. I'm still old, you guys. I'm just as old as I was at the beginning of the podcast. A little bit more, even. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. The man show. Uh, Port number two is, is Sphagnikins. What? Sphagnikins? Sphagnikins. Sphagnikins. Wow. Would you pass that Sphagnikin? Hey there. Nice sphagnikin you got there. I'm trying to like <laughs> test it out. See the taste of the word. Um, uh, applied makeup. I'm going to say it applied makeup of some Applies sort. makeup. You apply makeup yeah. with a sphagnikin. <laughs> I do think it's like some sort of like napkin. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. Or yeah. something like that. I'm going to say it's like to wipe off a seat before you were going to sit. It's mm. like a, a specific handkerchief, a high, yeah. heavy duty handkerchief where you're like, I'm going to. I'm going to do something. I'm going to sit here, wipe yeah. it off with a sphagnikin. Sam, just for clarity, you're still on makeup, right? Yeah, I know it's a butt thing, okay. but I'm still on makeup. <laughs> it's not a butt thing. <laughs> okay. But that might have gotten you closer than Sari. But Sari, certainly with a heavy-duty napkin, has has got it because it okay. was a, a, an early commercial feminine hygiene product, mm. which gets its name mm. from one of its main materials, which is sphagnum moss. I don't know if you know about sphagnum, that, but it's okay. a moss and it's yes. absorbent. It uh, has a lot. Of, so uh, prior to the development of sanitary napkins, people who menstruated would use pieces of cloth to absorb the fluids. Instead, the first disposable product for menstruation was sold in 1896 by Johnson & Johnson. So they were up to it even back then, but it didn't <laughs> sell particularly well. The creation of better surgical dressings during World War One led to the creation of better menstruation products as well, including the Sphagnikin, which was created by uh, the Sphagnum Moss Products Company. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what do we Love do that. with this moss? <laughs> I just got to come up with more we ideas. Got, we got so much damn um, moss. A sphagnum moss can absorb more than 20 times its dry weight in fluid and also has antibacterial wow. properties. Uh -huh. As a sanitary napkin, the moss was wrapped up in gauze and sold with safety mm. pins that you could use to attach it to undergarments. The package featured a girl dressed up in a uniform similar to those that Red Cross nurses wore. Ultimately, sphagnikins didn't sell that well, though, losing out to Kotex and its cotton equivalents that showed up in the market around the same time. I think the Excellent. marketing strategy was wrong. I think you don't dress them up as a little nurse. You dress them up as a little like forest gremlin. Little bog like, creature. You want to be one with nature? <laughs> <laughs> Use moss. <laughs> of course you're not going to win with cotton if you have a little yes. nurse. You have to lean into mm -hmm. your demographic of A lady crawling out of the swamp. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, Sarah's killing it so yeah. far. And our final word, uh, word number three is a beard token. I, I'm i probably going to lose this one, but it popped into my head and I love it. A beard <laughs> token is like a locket for a beard that you loved very, very much. Oh, Once you shave so it off, good. you collect oh, yeah. all the little shavings and you put them mm -hmm. in a beard token and then you're like, rip to that beard. Man, I love like, that keep guy. Keep it close to my heart. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I'm not even going to try to top that. It's like a... It's like a thing you'd give to a barber. 
and they'd cut your beard for free or something like that. Mm. One free beard trimming, please. That is definitely closer to the true fact, Sam. Wow. Okay. Which, uh, in in that it is like related to money and it's a kind of currency. So beard tokens were a coin given to Russian men in the 18th century to show that they had paid their beard tax. So you could be like, the official would be like, you got a beard. And you'd be like, nope, I'm good. I did it. I paid my beard tax. Because okay. in 1698, when Tsar Peter the Great returned from a trip to Europe that inspired his plan to Europeanize Russia, in part through style changes like removing facial hair, uh, uh -huh. he gathered various diplomats and aides, and then he uh, bought a barber's razor so that he could shave all of their beards himself. Wow. <laughs> shave it by the Tsar. Amazing. Presumably, uh, he could not be the personal barber to all of Russia, so he instituted a beard tax to incentivize people to shave their beards. To keep your beard, you had to pay 100 rubles. If you were a peasant, you could keep your beard until you went into a city, at which point you might have to pay a small fine. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> but to show that you'd pay your tax, you'd be given a token, a token of copper, or if you paid more, you could get a silver one. The coin was embossed with the image of lips, mustache, and a beard. The tax was eventually repealed, though, uh, in like a hundred years. It's a handsome token, though. Yeah, I want one. I bet yeah, they're very too. expensive. Maybe we uh, could fake them. We could make a fake beard token. Make fake beard tokens. Mm -hmm. This company right here already is doing that. You can get them for ten dollars. Yep. You can buy them from the <laughs> Smithsonian as well. So, <laughs> dang it! Other people had the idea first. The beard token of the month club. That's Hank's new club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sari is still in the lead with two to Sam's one. Next up, we're going to take a short break, and then it's time for the Fact Off. SciShow Tangents is brought to you today by Henson Shaving. I am a beard shaver, and as such, I got to tell you, shaving can be not fun. You can go to the store and get some cheapo razor that's going to clog it up with every swipe and go dull almost instantly, or you can get a subscription razor and be stuck with a razor that only takes like one kind of razor head and it might just clog up and go, go dull too. Then what are you going to do? And ouchie, your poor face, dull razor, no good. Well, my friends, let me tell you about Henson Shaving. It's a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer. They've made parts for the International Space Station, for Mars rovers, and now they're making parts for your face. They're bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. Bad shaving isn't a blade problem. It's an extension problem. Razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more wobble. The more wobble, the more nicks and cuts and pulls and scrapes. And by using aerospace-grade CNC machines, Henson makes metal razors that extend just 0 0.0013 inches, which if that sounds pretty small, that's because it's pretty small. It's less than the thickness of a human hair. And that means a secure and stable blade and a wobbleless shave. And the razor features built-in channels that make clogging virtually impossible. Even better, the Henson razor works with standard dual-edged blades that you could buy any old place to give you an old-school shave using new-school tech. Once you own a Henson razor, it's only like 3 to $5 per year to replace the blades. Henson Shaving wants to make the best razor not the best razor business, which means no plastic, no subscriptions, no proprietary blades, no planned obsolescence. That's wild. Who would do that? Only a madman. <laughs> Look... <laughs> <laughs> I shaved with a razor from Henson for this very episode. Look oh, how smooth. Am sure. I silky smooth, baby bottom smooth? Absolutely. The thing that I really like about it is that there's no plastic handle. There's no nasty little plastic cartridge that gets all gunky and you have to throw away every few weeks. It's all metal, baby. So it's helping me cut down on my plastic consumption, which hosting the show has made me very anxious about. It's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a precision engineered razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com slash tangents to pick the razor for you and use code tangents and you will get two years worth of blades for free for, with your razor. Just make sure that you add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to hensonshaving.com slash tangents. Use the code tangents.
Now get ready for the fact talk. Our panelists have all brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind, and after they have all presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. Fish can't just rely on the water all around them to keep them clean. Sometimes they need help removing ectoparasites on their bodies or bits of diseased skin. Luckily, in the ocean, there are small fish that help with that problem. These fish occupy small areas called cleaning stations that other reef fish can show up to for inspection. Between 2005 and 2009, scientists studying an area near the Philippines watched as pelagic thresher sharks approached a cleaning station run by a fish called the Blue Streaked Cleaner Wrasse. How long was the average shark visit to the cleaning station? I love that you said run by, like he's got a little <laughs> business, which he does. Yeah, he does. Got a little business. Come on by. Visit me. I'm I'm a fish. I think they're getting these sharks out. I think they're in there for yeah. four minutes tops. I think they're luxuriating. I think this mm. is a, we'll sit on down. We're going to wash your feet. <laughs> <laughs> Clean your ectoparasites. I think it's like 30 minutes, like a full Ooh. spa session. Oh, wow. I don't think a shark has 30 minutes to spare, but okay. Yeah, Sam true. is much closer at six and a half minutes, 6.27 if you want to get all the significant figures in. <laughs> in the paper, the scientists called the visiting sharks clients, which is it's even so better. So cute. During the period they were watching the cleaning station, they uh, documented 97 visits. See, they got a lot of sharks to get through. Yep. You're right, yeah. you're right. They take walk-ins. The longest <laughs> visit, though, was 23 minutes. Okay. Oh, that's Some the king of sharks. Possible. Yeah. Like the deluxe treatment. Or that was a That's nasty right. shark. That stinky, stinky <laughs> shark. <laughs> Kept trying shark to was leave. Like, you didn't like... get the bit back there. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's like when you like you want to run through the wa- the car wash a second time. They yeah. always say that. These like, do you want to go around a second time? And I'm like, nah, I don't actually care. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That means that, Sam, you get to go first. All right. Here I go. Health, hygiene, and beauty tips are basically inescapable. For better and worse, things doctors hate, mind blowing beauty tips of the stars, and today's hottest hairstyles <laughs> make up a not insignificant portion of clickbait headlines and banner ads. And even before the internet, magazines full of the same kind of tips sat and continue to sit in probably every grocery store in the entire world, I would guess. But just how far sure. back does the human urge to give other people hygiene advice go? In 2016, a team of scientists were excavating the ancient city of Lachish, located in modern-day Israel on the Lachish River. This area was first inhabited by humans approximately 5,500 years ago, and one of its early inhabitants were a group of people known as the Canaanites, I think, a Bronze Age ancient Near East civilization that was around during the second millennium BCE, so that's sometime between 2000 BCE and 1001 BCE. So this team is digging up some Bronze Age structures. They're finding all your basic archaeological type stuff like jars, pieces of jars, (laughs) etc. But they also found (laughs) a little ivory comb, which as we have maybe mentioned at some point, I don't think we ended up doing it. Combs aren't that uncommon in artifact, I assume. Mm -hmm. We probably used a lot of combs in the species history. But the team recognized this comb as a lice comb. Hygiene. So they sent this comb back to the lab, determined it was from about 1700 BCE, uh, and they found a fossilized louse nymph on it. So that's pretty cool. After that, the comb sat around in the lab. I guess sometimes they would check it out again to see if they could find more lice or something. I don't know. But then in 2021, a researcher took a good look at some of the engraving and texture on the comb and noticed that the comb was, in fact, engraved with 17 one millimeter tall letters, forming seven words in the Canaanite language. In English, it translates to may this tusk root out the lice of the hair and the beard ancient hygiene advice from the distant distant past but here's what you got to know about the written canaanite language it's thought to date back to enslaved and lower class people of ancient egypt who weren't allowed to or able to learn the large and complicated hieroglyphic writing system used in egypt but eventually they were like oh we need a way to write our language down so they adapted a few select hieroglyphics into symbols which translated into specific sounds thus creating what many researchers consider to be the original alphabet from which the latin alphabet descended from (gasps) so back to the comb archaeologists have found examples of canaanite writing on other artifacts and ancient graffiti 
uh, and they've been able to piece together the language uh, from those and other ancient documents about the Canaanites. But this comb was the first time a full sentence from a primary source written in the Canaanite language was found, which also makes it most likely the oldest sentence that we've ever found wow. written in an alphabetic script. And much like uh, the magazines and click clickbait of today is giving unsolicited hygiene advice. So, you know, <laughs> things haven't really changed that much if you think about it. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I see how that would be helpful for the removal of, like it's very specifically purpose-built for the removal of bugs. And now we've got a very similar device today with those like super close together times that you mm-hmm. use with your child when they get lice. So they don't have fun messages on them. I feel like that's a missed opportunity. They should. This May one this says, separate me. you from your gross bugs. Kid. <laughs> you nasty little kid. <laughs> you nasty little kid. <laughs> <laughs> or like, you know how popsicle sticks have jokes on them? Oh, you yes. Have that That'd on it. Fun. Yeah. What did one life say to another life? Uh, I don't have yeah. a punchline. Well, it's like, this sucks or something. I don't know. I don't know what life's yeah, doing, I guess, actually. Oh, yeah. This sucks. All right, Siri, what do you have? So, despite the fact that so many humans deal with menstrual hygiene directly or indirectly, the scientific literature is pretty scarce and public knowledge can feel mm. even scarcer. So, in 1980, when the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, pointed to superabsorbent tampons as a cofactor in causing a brand new illness called toxic shock syndrome, there was quite a public health scare. And I don't know about other people, but instilling fear of toxic shock was a key element of my teenage health education. (laughs) And this incident is actually the origin of all that. So, for context, toxic shock syndrome is a pretty rare illness, but it can be life threatening if you don't get treatment quickly. It can happen in any person infected with enough Staphylococcus aureus bacteria that there's a buildup of specific toxins in the bloodstream, which causes an overreaction from your immune system that leads to things like fever, low blood pressure, and organ failure, or possibly death. There were hundreds to thousands of cases of toxic shock syndrome in the U.S. in the 1970s and 1980s, many of which were in menstruating people using super absorbent tampons, which is why the CDC sounded the alarms. And after years of research, I had to include this because I wanted to know. We learned why this happened, um, including things like the newish synthetic absorbent materials, introducing pockets of oxygen into a typically anaerobic Mm. environment or Mm. causing abrasions to the vaginal wall and the higher pH of menstrual blood, all of that kind of combined to the perfect storm that let already existing staph bacteria in some people multiply to dangerous levels. And mucous membranes allow things like toxins to absorb into the bloodstream more easily. But at the time, we didn't know any of that. And the CDC and FDA were just like, oh no, to be safe, people (laughs) should avoid super absorbent tampons because they seem bad. But then they realized that companies were all making different claims about absorbency. Mm. And thus, the tampon task force was assembled (laughs) in 1982 by the American Society for Testing and Materials. It is a truly wild name for a group of companies, social activist organizations, and researchers that together had to try and agree with each other on menstrual hygiene, which is the wildest assignment to give that giant group of people, including Johnson & Johnson was there too. Uh, no sphagnum moss. <laughs> as as there, yeah, this, the, the sphagnum moss people, however, had just gone back to the swamp. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where they where they should be. Um, but basically, they came up with a standard scale of whether a tampon is regular or super or super plus by mm-hmm. measuring the grams of fluid it can absorb. And to do that, they designed a wild contraption called the <laughs> syngina, short for <laughs> synthetic. Vagina. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, they <laughs> shoved a tampon in and trickled salt water on it to measure absorbency, which is weirdly uh, similar to all those commercials nowadays that people make fun of. Hmm? And anyone who knew even a fraction about menstruation was like, wait, salt water is nothing like the blood, mucus, cellular debris goop that tampons actually have to deal with. And one lab went a little rogue and tested with expired donated red blood cells that they sourced from a nearby hospital and found that tampons actually absorb a higher mass of blood than saline solution, which you'd think Mm -hmm. would be valuable data that other people would follow up on, but it didn't lead anywhere, mostly because the tampon task force was disbanded in 1985 after three short years, and we were left with synginas and saline solutions as the industry standard that continues today. 
Uh, and the whole reason I found out about this was a study published in August 2023, so very recently, that tested menstrual hygiene products with expired donated human blood and said that was unusual in their press release. So basically, there's a ton of room for research and important health, public health knowledge with this sector of hygiene. And we need more tampon task force and other type of That's task right. force, Bring apparently. It back. I mean, blood isn't hard to get, especially non-human blood, which definitely seems like <laughs> it would be better than saline. Yeah. So I just feel like that should have been the thing that we did. That seems like a pretty obvious conclusion to draw, but... But now, did this have something to do with toxic shock syndrome? That, like, did it turn out that, like, it was, it was like, we just had to change the way we were doing it? And it became less of a problem. So toxic shock syndrome like spurred the formation of the tampon task force. And it allowed people to choose less absorbent tampons and like standardized them. So people could choose ones that are more suited for them. Mm -hmm. And then separately from this, there's just been like better education on it. And I think better materials used where like don't use super absorbent and leave it in for 12 plus hours. Right. You want to like use a less absorbent tampon and change it more regularly but scare people appropriately which is very hard to do yeah. scaring people appropriately is so hard because there's a bell curve of scared then in order to get everybody to appropriately scared you have to push a lot of people into too scared mm. and that is i don't know how to solve that problem from a public health perspective Synginas. Synginas are Synginas, the answer that's what we need yes just make whole human bodies without brains and we'll do stuff to them I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> totally ethical and good, Hank. <laughs> yeah, what can we yeah. scare people bad enough with that that'll become normal and good? <laughs> yeah, we'll figure it out. Oh, I have to choose a winner. It's a weird gesture. I have to. It made sense to me. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. let it. Let the truth. The truth flow through me. Pray to Hygiena, uh, the Pray Greek goddess. Hygiena. Yes, you're mm-hmm. communing with Hygiena. Uh-huh. Hygiena, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> God damn. Okay, I, I think it's wild to me that they that this is so new and that we have so recently. I mean, this is both quite new, but that we have so recently found the first ever sentence. And that it's related to hygiene. Uh, that's got to be the winner. That's got to be the winner. And I think that it puts Sam over the top. I was going to say, I think it's not the first. It's the first sentence in an alphabetical thing. I think there's probably yes. a, yes, a different dialect or a different writing yeah. system that has it early. But yes, yeah, you are it's correct. our first sentence. for In our alphabet and something yes. related to our alphabet, yes. which is dope. All right, now it's time to ask the science couch where we've got a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. Luca Luke on Discord asks, how bad or not bad is aluminum in deodorant or antiperspirant? If it's bad, it's very hard to tell. Mm. Uh, We have not found a lot of evidence that it's bad. Uh, And that usually indicates that if it is bad, it's very a little bit bad. But I... I actually don't know well enough to stay that, say that with any confidence. Very, you don't know. You can't say very a little bit bad with any confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what I said? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean, though. You know what I mean? I think yeah, I do. You I do. hit the nail on the head. Anyone coming to Tangents for a clickbait headline answer is going to get eh, sometimes very a little bit uh, as the answer <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So. The first antiperspirant was called EverDry and trademarked in 1903 in the U.S. Jeez. And EverDry's active ingredient was uh, aluminum chloride. And the way that yeah. aluminum salts work in antiperspirant is that they cause an obstruction of sweat gland ducts. And so what we think happens is the, the metal ions react in some way with the mucus polysaccharides, mucopolysaccharides, and clog them up. Um, And they kind of damage the epithelial cells, the skin cells around the glands. And they form like a gooey plug that blocks sweat output for a given amount of time. Like, it seems like something you shouldn't do, Mm -hmm. is how I feel. It's like, the body's normal function. Let's stop that from Plug happening. It up. And that yeah. and that was like the main anti sentiment when antiperspirants first came out was that blocking right. sweating sweating is natural, blocking sweating is unhealthy. 
And I think that kind of snowballed into even after we found formulations that let the aluminum salts exist and the three big ones that like people are worried about with these aluminum compounds in antiperspirants are cancer, uh, specifically breast cancers, because Mm -hmm. um, you're applying antiperspirants in many cases to armpit area. Mm. But there hasn't been any convincing evidence or consistent evidence that antiperspirant or aluminum compounds from antiperspirant collects in breast tissue, leads to cancer, tumor growth, or anything like that. Um, Even if they found, detected a couple chemicals, there was no link between that and breast cancer risk. The second one was Alzheimer's because in the 1960s, a couple studies were finding um, levels of aluminum in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. And people just made the connection of like, oh, there's Mm -hmm. aluminum in brains. Oh, there's aluminum in antiperspirant. So um, there was a lot of fear and other studies in the 1970s and onwards, the findings, like no findings were replicated that aluminum and antiperspirant could make its way to the brain in any way uh, or it mm-hmm. has anything to do with neurodegeneration. It kind of stays goopy in your sweat pores and that's it. And then same thing with the th- third one was kidney disease. So um, there were there were concerns when dialysis patients were given a drug called aluminum hydroxide to help people control high phosphorus levels in their blood and then their kidneys um, couldn't remove the aluminum fast enough, but taking a a drug orally is very different from like rubbing something on your skin with your sweat glands. Um, and mm-hmm. they're two very different, like aluminum hydroxide is very different from aluminum chloride or other compounds in antiperspirants. Mm-hmm. Again, the aluminum that you rub on your skin or get into your sweat glands, like once that mucus or the dead skin or whatever you're doing to clog up your pores gets excreted and you sweat again, it kind of washes its way out. So um, Uh, according to dermatologists, as far as I have read, I tried to investigate these as thoroughly as I could. Um, There isn't really anything, but, but I think it's rooted in this idea that it's unnatural to block your sweat and oh, metal chemicals around our body. Uh Um, (laughs) Uh-oh. Which I don't know is always, is always like really complicated when you're communicating health and medicine. Like I, I'm, poking a little bit of fun and maybe being a little bit mean because I know our audience is also like trust science, but I think this can be really scary for people who don't necessarily understand um, and hear messages like aluminum in my deodorant could be bad for me and my brain um, or could cause cancer. It is remarkable though, how good we have gotten at like you hear about like an increase in the chance of cancer and it's, much smaller than it sounds, but like epidemiologists are looking at how do you, they're looking at like a hundred people per hundred thousand, you know? And it's like, how do you get that to 99 Mm. is what they're thinking or 97 or 95, but eat fiber, eat healthy exercise. We know what works. We don't have to do fad diets. It's been the same fad diet forever. (laughs) Eat less sugar, eat plants eat protein. That's it. Fiber. There should be fiber in the food. This is what my doctor was telling me yesterday. Um, He's like, you need to be healthier now because you're, you got all this shit wrong with you because we poisoned you. And I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, just eat, you know, it's what it sounds like, man. But what about the what about the Cadbury eggs you find on the ground, Hank? I don't know. YouTube just sent me a bunch of Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> anyway, let's end the episode. If you like the show, you want to help us out. Super easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow tangents, become a patron, get access to our newsletter, our bonus episodes, and big news, we have hit 700 patrons on the Tangents Patreon, which means we're going to be doing our Minions commentary. I don't know when. Going to do it. Get ready. It's a a whole lot about this. (laughs) If that sounds good to you, be sure to join our Patreon at any level to get access to that commentary as soon as it's released. Second, leave us a review wherever you listen. That's very helpful. It helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell Tell people people about about us. us. 
We'll see you next time for our first episode of our annual Trick or Treat Month of Surprise Guests. But for now, thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Siri Riley. Uh, and I've been Sorry, I, I panicked. I was like, am I next? Sideshow <laughs> <laughs> Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our associate producer is Eve Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Glickspin. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazzio. Our editorial assistant is Deboki Chalker. Rivardi. Our sound design is by Joseph Tunamedish. Our executive producers are Nicole Steen and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you, and remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled. But one more thing. In many cases, we learn about personal hygiene because our parents tell us, wash your hands or don't like that. And a study published (laughs) in February 2023 suggests that the same might be true for mandrills, the biggest kind of monkey. These researchers (laughs) observed mandrills grooming each other socially with one exception. When many group members were infected with gut parasites, some females avoided grooming the perianal region of other monkeys. The researchers classify this butthole avoidance as hygienic behavior because it helps these females avoid parasite-related illness. Over the six years of observations, they noticed that mother-daughter or maternal half-sister pairs of mandrels share similar hygiene when it comes to perianal grooming. So basically, it seems like the moms are telling their daughters not to touch someone else's parasite-ridden butthole. (laughs) (laughs) Great advice if I ever heard it. (laughs) 